Thank you, Francis. I will take a moment to point out Chris. She's here with us at the back of the room. And so you have the entire, almost the entire company in the room with you uh, today. So any questions you have, we should be able to, to address. Uh, another important, important collaborator on this project is the Institute for Bird Populations out of um, just north of San Francisco in California. And I'll, I'll let you know why that is in a moment. But I do want to acknowledge Peter Pyle and his colleagues out of the Institute for Bird Populations as a partner in this program. And uh, we do have another collaborator through the University of Calgary. Chris is currently working on a graduate program as well. So she wears two hats. One is a researcher in the field and one is a researcher in the university. So what is MAPS? Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. It's a mark recapture bird banding program coordinated by the Institute for Bird Populations out of California. It's based on a science-driven rigorous protocol that was written by them about 20 years ago and implemented across the continent uh, since then with much of its focus in the U.S. It, last year, it achieved its 20-year mark. We saw, together with the Institute, a gap in the research uh, conducted in that the boreal forest is the breeding ground for about half of the migrant neotropical birds uh, that we experience in this part of the world, and yet it is overwhelmingly underrepresented in the boreal forest. So this is a map showing you roughly the distribution of map stations that have been established at least for one year, and in the U.S., we have about 1,000 stations that have provided data for one or more years. In Canada, that number's in around the 30s, and up until 2011, five in the boreal forest. So five out of 1,000 a, a stations are providing, providing data on, on productivity and survivorship on boreal-dependent species, a really significant data gap. Four of those stations are in Alberta, located near the Lesser Slave Lake Bird Observatory, one in Ontario. And over the past two years, we have uh, implemented, starting with six stations in 2011 and 18 more, 24 stations in and around the Fort McMurray area. It's, it's, you might think Fort McMurray, you might think oil sands, you would be correct. This is driven a lot by the oil sands, but this is not an oil sand specific research program. It is a program in the boreal forest and we're in the region of the oil sands developments. And just to illustrate the, the importance of the boreal forest, if you think about the, the process of migration, we have half of the birds up in the boreal forest uh, breeding. They then winter somewhere south, South U.S., Mexico, Central America, some even insofar as Argentina. And so if you're not gathering data on these birds in their breeding habitat, any kind of population dynamics studies and effects studies that you might want to do on those birds will be hampered. A quick review of the MAPS protocol. It's a mist netting protocol, so we capture the birds uh, take them from the mist net to a, a portable banding station and apply a, a bird band issued by the Canadian Wildlife Service. The MAPS protocol is focused on the breeding season. So we start after migration is over in the spring. And the birds have established and settled into their territories. And we finish banding before fall migration starts and we get the influx from the north or the departure of our birds to the south. So we're very clearly focused on the breeding period of the, of the songbirds. That's in, our, in, in that region, that's 60 days long, from June 10th to August 8th. And that 60-day period is broken into six 10-day periods. In each of those 10-day periods, a banding station is operated once. And a crew, can a crew of two can operate six of these banding stations. So six out of every 10 days, a crew is active for six consecutive periods. A total of 36 banding mornings for a crew. And each station, as I say, gets visited six times. The mist nets open at dawn. And I should say that dawn in Fort McMurray comes early. And uh, alarm clocks get set for 1.32 in the morning. So if you're not a morning person... This is not necessarily the program for you. They're open for six hours. Um, 
And it, so it's constant effort misnetting. And, and the protocol does allow for some adjustment of that six hours to accommodate for poor weather. So if you get halfway through a morning and it rains, that's really dangerous for the birds caught in nets. So you shut your nets and you're done for the day. You can come back and start on another day at that time and complete the six-hour period. So we try for constancy as much as we possibly can. The key data that we're collecting are productivity data, which is production of young birds. This metric is specific, or pretty specific, to the breeding grounds. So any change in productivity is giving you some insight into what's happening on the breeding grounds. We collect survivorship data, which is the return of a banded bird from one year into a future year. And it's a, it becomes a probability assessment because you're not recapturing all the birds, you're capturing a percentage of them. But with the statistics that the, the program uh, has behind it, it's a measure of longevity of the birds, and it gives you insight into age structure of the population that you're dealing with. A change in survivorship would suggest that you have a change happening or a, a pressure being put on the populations outside of the production zone. So on migration south in the wintering grounds or on migration north or, one, or two or more of those. We're in the field and we're collecting a number of species of birds for banding. We're also listening, um, watching, observing the whole time. Before we open nets in the morning, we conduct a standard 10-minute ten, ten point count, a standard method for assessing bird diversity and relative abundance in the, the boreal forest. Uh, and then during the, the banding period, the six-hour banding period, and indeed, even as we're closing down the nets and wrapping things up, we're still listening and watching for birds. And we record every bird that we, every bird species that we hear, see, um, and its behavior. Is it passing through? Is it singing a territorial song? Is it carrying food, fecal sac, whatever? So what we're trying to do is attribute uh, a behavior to a breeding, a breeding behavior to the habitat and, and define how that habitat is being used. And, and uh, point counts are not part of the standard MAPS protocol, but we're doing that so that we can try and correlate what is done routinely in the region for EIAs, for long-term monitoring programs, with something that has uh, a different spin on the type of data being collected. And then uh, the MAPS protocol has a habitat structure assessment associated with it as well. So we do a, a forest habitat structure assessment that looks at species composition and percent cover of, of, um, of vegetation at each of four levels. Ground cover, um, understory, up to half a meter tall. Midstory, up to um, five meters tall canopy. So we're, we're looking at how the habitat structures are relating to bird behavior, bird abundance, productivity, and survivorship. Just a quick photo array of, of what it looks like to be a mist netting. How many people in the room have done mist netting? Awesome. Okay, so this isn't a surprise to half of you. Um, our nets are 12 meters long, 2 meters high, 4 panel. We set them up in, in areas where you know, we clear a net lane. Uh, that will accommodate the net, but we, we try and keep it really tight because we don't want to both affect the habitat and we're trying to hide the net. So the more you cut, the less hidden it is. And just a collection of, of birds, a chipping sparrow, a Tennessee warbler, yellow warbler. This is a recapture. It's got a band on its leg. And the birds typically fly into the net, get lightly tangled. Uh, we make regular rotations of the nets. They, they, um, a half an hour uh, is, is our target to visit each net and extract the birds. Banding, we, we take the birds out of the nets and put them in these, these little cloth bags, and there's a silhouette of a bird. They tend to rest somewhat peacefully in the bags. They, they can't see the activity outside, and, uh, and they'll, they'll hold for, for a period of time before processing quite, quite fine. Putting bands on, um, Tennessee warbler, white-throated sparrow, gray jay, those are fun. Um, we age and sex. First of all, before you put a band on a bird, you've got to know the species. That's, that's absolutely critical. Uh, after that, you put the band on so that if it gets away, you at least have a data point. Um, then we age, uh, sex the, species, uh, the, the birds. Um, sexing is, is often as easy as blowing on the belly and, and exposing the brood patch. You now know you have a breeding female. Uh, there's male anatomical structures as well. And then plumage can sometimes help you. Uh, we take wing measurements, fat scores, uh, any observations on injuries or 
or um, the parasitism. Aging is typically done on the basis of the feather morphology on the wing. And, and feathers grown on birds who are in the nest, just hatched, have a different structure and morphology than the feather, the, the second set of feathers, which has a different structure and morphology than the third set, after which the differentiation becomes so minor you can't tell the difference. So you can um, age fairly precisely younger birds, but you cannot age very precisely or accurately older birds. And so we just categorize them as hatch year, being hatched in the year we have them, um, if we can't tell how old they are, but we know they're not a hatch year, they become an after hatch year. That's really creative. If we can tell that second year, they become a second year bird, and then an after second year, and then we just move on from there. Occasionally, it can rain on us, or there's a threat of rain, we'll pack in a tent. Uh, if the bugs are really bad, and they can be up in the boreal, we pack in a tent. And, uh, and that's just essentially our portable banding station. Okay, with the overview, uh, we'll get into the project itself. So early on, we had essentially four objectives. The first one, which was a 2011 objective, was to demonstrate that MAPS is, in fact, applicable in the boreal forest. Uh, 20 years of, of banding, but not much in the boreal forest. We definitely wanted to confirm that the protocol was applicable. And it's not on here because we were able to say very quickly, yes, it did work. So our longer-term uh, objectives are to understand how birds are using reclaimed habitats and those that are subject to other human and industrial disturbances. This is the, the, the industrial oil sands linkage for this particular region. So reclamation is a big hot topic. Reclamation progress is, is um, you know, in many ways slower than people would like. We're on the cusp of a, what I believe to be a fairly significant wave of reclamation. And now the question is, how do we assess reclamation performance? The, the complex of bird species that migrate back and forth provides an ideal tool, we think, to help assess reclamation performance. Continentally, many, um, many bird species are in decline, and the factors responsible for that decline are not precisely known uh, or as much as we, we think we should know. And so uh, population may be decreasing at a, at, a, at a rate, and we don't know, is this because of problems on the breeding grounds. Is this problems on the wintering grounds? Has habitat in between during migration fallen short of supporting the populations as they move back and forth? So the IBP, with their data set over 20 years, uh, productivity and survivorship being two key determinants of population structure, has been trying to figure out where in that process is the effect happening. And again, we go back to the one of my original statements of uh, boreal forest data are lacking. So how can we talk about productivity being a driver of population change if we have no productivity data? Our second objective, then, is to feed our data into the continental database so that we, we together with IBP, can um, begin to attribute those uh, effects to factors of, of population decline. And now we have a network of banding stations established in the boreal forest. It would be a shame if these were not made available to others to come in and do research, either complementary to uh, the, the work we're doing, or even if it's totally independent, it's a, it's a platform on which it can be done. The only rule we have is that that research cannot compromise objectives one and two. This is a least flycatcher, one of the species on the sensitive species list. So most of what I'll talk about today is 2011. We're still crunching the numbers from 2012. The report is due in, in three to four weeks. So in three to four weeks, this whole presentation will undergo a bit of an upgrade. But we'll focus on 2011, and I'll give you an update on 2012. Our design uh, to start out with was to um, pair our effort or, or split our effort equally between assessing what the natural range of variability is versus what we're seeing in, in areas that are affected by industrial dis disturbance or reclaimed areas. So we have three what we call natural habitats. From top to bottom, they're the V-shaped wetland. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well or not, but there's a wetland there in the shape of a V. There's a beaver pond uh, site, um, not a horribly unique um, identifier for the boreal forest, but it came to mind as, as a good name for, for that station, and then a station along the Muskeg River, which winds its way down towards the Athabasca River, um, about two kilometers away. 
in the southern area, sort of um, west of Highway 63, so on the Syncrude side, we have three stations. Gateway and Bison are reclaimed environments. Gateway Hill, you may have heard, is the provincially certified reclaimed 104 hectare patch. Um, I think it was certified four years ago, give or take. Bison, and Gateway was reclaimed in the late 80s, early 90s. Bison is about 10 years uh, later, 10 years later, uh, reclamation, has a different reclamation prescription, which I'll come to in a moment. And it's um, on a knoll. Syncrude calls it the South Hills, so if you've ever been up there, um, that's the area. And it overlooks um, a tailings pond. And then we have, oh, magnify shake, um, Beaver Creek Diversion System. This is a semi-natural environment where uh, the diversion system was created in the 70s to divert water so that Syncrude could actually begin its program, its, its, its operation. Uh, it's been subject to some historical for, uh, forestry practices, and it has a diversion channel running through the middle of it. But otherwise, it's not disturbed and reclaimed. It's, it's sort of semi-natural. So it's kind of an intermediate uh, place where we, we tested the, the program. What these places look like a little bit more, more closely, uh, what we're trying to do is... in, in is standardize, at least at, at, in the early days, our placement of our, our nets, and that's in riparian or close to water, trending into a more mature forest environment. So although there are some differences among our stations, they all have that basic tenant of proximity to water and then some nets that are further into the bush uh, so that we're capturing the different habitats that are there, but we're also maximizing our captures by being a little bit closer to the water. And each net samples birds nesting in an approximate 100-meter radius. So even if we're in the riparian, we are capturing birds as they forage and move around in the habitat, even if they're nesting in the nearby spruce, spruce forest. So, um, and, and then after, after having said all that, the one difference is, is bison. It didn't have uh, flowing or standing water except for a small um, open wetland. But over the next couple of years, Syncrude will be converting the tailings pond into, it's one of the larger reclamation projects starting up um, next year. Uh, much of the tailings water will be removed. The, the mature tailings in, underneath will stay, but it will be capped with fresh water. And the water level will rise relative to where it is right now. So water will encroach towards us. So we will have that water influence within a couple of years. And then, as I indicated, there's a diversion channel that runs down uh, around um, the Syncrude operation. And this is the Beaver Creek Diversion System, which takes a, a river that went north at one point, a small river, moves it over, and then redirects it south and to the Athabasca. Our natural sites, the V-shaped wetland, Muskeg River, Beaver Pond, um, they're all undisturbed in terms of their, their soils and their trees. There may have been way back when some historic forestry practices, but the trees here are all fairly mature. You will notice that uh, although we call them natural, it's a little hard to get away from all of the various disturbances that are going on in the area. This is the Hammerstone Quarry, Limestone Quarry. Um, this is the Fort Mackay Industrial Park owned by the Fort Mackay Group of Companies. So this is a laydown construction service yard, and it's you know relatively close to Muskeg River. V-shaped wetlands relatively close to the quarry, but even more importantly, Shell's Muskeg River mine expansion has come down fairly uh, low here, and everything on the north side of that road has been disturbed into a tailing pond. So we're in the process of seeing how things are going to change, even though the plot of land we're on isn't disturbed, the area around it is changing, and we'll be able to monitor changes in bird populations, uh, even though the area itself isn't disturbed. Looking then at our, our numbers from 2011, we banded 1,605 birds. These are new, new captures. Uh, 34 little devils got away from us before we could put a band on them, but we did get some data on them. At least we could identify them. So they, they count. It's a data point. Almost 300 birds that were originally banded earlier in the season were recaptured later in the season. So there, certainly there's a lot of, um, as you'd expect from nesting birds, fidelity to the habitat. They're hanging around. We're, we're intercepting them more than once. Our, our effort is measured in net hours. One net up for one hour is a net hour. 
So if you sum up all of the nets up for individual hours, we come up with 2,100 net hours and a capture rate of 552 birds per 600 net hours. That 600 net hours is a bit awkward, but it's the historical units of measure that IBP has used since the beginning of the program. And that's based on an idealized station of 10 nets, each operated for six hours uh, for a... um, the 10 day period of the program, the, sorry, the 10 periods. As you go further south, you actually have, um, instead of a 60 day period of uh, uh, duration of banding, you have 70, 80, or 90. Uh, and again, it's based on the start and end of migration. So the take home message is 552 per 600 net hours. The number of species that we were. Um, Banding at each of the stations is is listed there. It ranges from about 20 to 35, 37. If you add it all up, we we banded 52 individual species over the six stations in 2011, of which one to four were on either or both of the provincial or federal uh, sensitive species lists under SARA or SRD's guide, Guide to Wild Species, I think it's called. What you might note here is Gateway, the provincially certified reclaimed area, had a fairly low number of new bandings, fairly low capture rate overall, and a relatively low uh, number of species, both total and listed, relative to the other stations. Gateway was, was planted in the 90s, early 90s. Its reclamation objective at the time was to grow commercial forest. Okay. It is succeeding. It is a successful reclamation area because society and the regulators at that time said you will grow uh, commercial forest. It wasn't necessarily constructed to provide a a structure for for songbirds. And its prescription was 25 centimeters of peat amended mineral mix over top of overburden. Just laid down in, in one lift. Okay. Let's look at bison. Bison had a really high capture rate relative to the others. Large number of species, both total and listed. Its prescription was 50 centimeters of material directly placed, which means it was salvaged in one area and brought over and directly placed, uh, and then it was planted into with spruce and aspen. The propagules in that soil mix have created a shrub layer in certain patches that has a much more complex uh, well, it's a much more complex structure relative to gateway, and we're seeing that reflected in the bird community that is present in breeding there. Uh, our stellar station was Muskeg River, um, and the other numbers there were, uh, well, on the basis of these numbers, we were able to conclude that at the end of 2011, the program works. So our first objective of testing the methodology, we were able to check that off. Productivity excuse me, is measured as number of hatch year birds, the birds hatched in that, that single year, uh, as a ratio to the adult birds or after hatch year. And here we don't discriminate the adults by any age. We just lump them all together as adults. And a number of one, meaning uh, one young being produced for one adult, is kind of a, a metric of population sustainability. The other uh, nuance here is that this is growth. So this is across all species at each station as opposed to by species. We also do this by species. Gateway, fairly low productivity. Bison, fairly high productivity. So here's two reclaimed areas performing quite differently in 2011. And again, I go back to the change in reclamation practices, some may say an improvement in reclamation practices, I might, and you're seeing a different structure in the forest that's being generated as a result. So what we're seeing is learning on how to reclaim being reflected in, in perhaps reflected in these data. Now, recall that I, I said we start each morning with a point count, 10 minutes, Stand at the banding station, listen and watch, record all the birds you see and how many of them, and here. And then we do the breeding status under the MAPS protocol, which is every bird that we see here banned um, over the six or more hours each morning we're there. So if you look at just effort here, you're seeing 10 minutes of effort. 
can't do the math right here, but uh, six hours each station would be six times eight, 48 hours of effort, give or take, between 40 and 48 hours. So it's not a surprise these numbers are lower than those numbers. Um, I've been a little harsh on point counts in the past, perhaps, and I'm just trying to be a little more objective in this statement in that you can do this methodology everywhere fairly quickly and cover a large region. Here you have to invest an awful lot of effort into a single spot. So you want to choose your spots carefully. And what we're trying to do is provide a way of correlating the two data sets so that you can get regional representation and focused investigation together in, a, in an interpretation of habitat quality. So just, I'll we'll just walk through uh, how this works. So at Beaver Creek Diversion System, we saw herd banded a total of 51 species of which nine appear on one or both of the provincial federal lists. 34, of which four were sensitive, exhibited some measure of breeding activity. So they're using the habitat or indicating they're using the habitat for breeding purposes. On the point count side, we heard or saw 12, of which 11 were exhibiting breeding, and this is almost exclusively their male territorial song. That's the other thing, is that this captures the uh, females, whereas this is predominantly male-driven because it's the breeding song. Now here, if you look at Gateway, it's not out of phase or out of line with the other, other stations. Here we have 42 is well within the range of the other stations, 22 is well within the range, as it is in the point count side. So our diversity of species that are present in the habitat is equivalent or apparently equivalent at Gateway as to the other stations, including bison, which could be argued as the lowest diversity. Um, and therefore, I kind of think of it this way, is there's a, a tiny pockets of habitat likely at Gateway, Gateway that satisfy the needs of a wide number of species, so we get good species diversity, but the habitat on the whole seems to be providing less resources for overall numbers of birds and the productivity of those birds. Again, a lesson in how reclamation practices can affect the long-term evolution and um, development of that habitat. So we did the habitat structure assessment and at the three natural stations, at the Beaver Creek Diversion System affected station and at the Bison Reclaimed Station, each of those has three vegetation types or patches and generally high percent cover in canopy, greater than 15, mid-story 5 to 15, understory 0 0.5 to 5, and ground cover below 0.5 meter levels. At Gateway, we actually have four vegetation patches, vegetation types. So laterally, we're more diverse, but structurally, vertically, we're less diverse in that we're missing much of the mid-story and understory levels. So our hypothesis is that if your reclamation practices can include an emphasis on those mid-story and understory species, then from at least a bird perspective and a wildlife perspective, the habitat that will be created is likely more productive and more amenable to your colonization. And I think I heard at the resiliency seminar on Tuesday, somebody said that up to this point, mid-story and understory have been optional in reclamation. And, and I, I emphasize up to this point, there's an emerging awareness that now it's time to start thinking about that. So that's the summary of, of 2011. 2012, we went from one crew, Chris and me, to four crews, Chris and me and three others, and added 18 stations. The bold italics are the ones from 2011. The others are 2012. Recall I said that we're trying to maintain a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of stations in natural habitats to those that are the sum of reclaimed and affected. We need to know the range of natural variability before we can assess anything in terms of affected or reclaimed. So we're putting half of our effort into natural variability. Our northernmost station is on the northern end of one of the All Sands Mines, Canadian Naturals Mine, and our southernmost station is on the Sand River, uh, southeast of Conklin, 250 kilometers separation from north to south. So we're pretty spread out. So one crew operates the six stations to the south, one to the six stations to the north, and two to the 12 in the middle. 
we've added some reclaimed habitats, and we've added um, predominantly habitats that are affected by forest fragmentation associated with the in situ side of the oil sands industry. So I, I, I'll just give a very brief overview. There's the mining, dig a big hole in the ground, move the material, process it, fill the hole back up with either material or water. And the in situ, there's not much of that surface disturbance, at least no hole in the ground. It tends to be more of a conventional oil and gas disturbance where it's cut lines, pipelines, roads, and small processing facilities. So the two different kinds of oil sands processing are imposing different stresses on the environment. And we're, we're moving into looking at how fragmentation can affect the bird populations and use of habitats. One of our stations on the Elds River is right now classified as natural, but within, I'm guessing, five or so years, an oil sands mine is going to move to within 200 meters of it. So we'll be able to see how the bird community transitions, if it transitions at all, uh, as industry, industry approaches closely. And then hopefully we're in business long enough to see how it changes as, as the reclamation process proceeds afterwards. So the, the new numbers from 2012, we banded almost 3,500 more birds and handled about 4,500 birds. Um, again, a few got away from us. We had 860 appear in the net that carried a band either from earlier in 2012 or even 2011. And I'll get to the, the recapture, year-to-year -year recaptures in a moment. And again, it's all ca uh, normalized to captures per net hour. And I hope all of you can see the bottom. I'll just point out a couple. Um, but I'll do this in the next slide. It's more clear. Comparing capture rates from 2011 and 2012, and we only had six stations that operated over both years. We had a couple of stations, Gateway and V-shaped wetland, that were almost identical in terms of capture rate. But bison are, are really high in 2011, really dropped in 2012, and beaver pond really went up. Now we're starting to see the natural variability. Overall, we had about a 25% decrease in capture captures. This is predominantly due to one species, the Tennessee warbler. It is a um, well-known cyclical species that varies in population due to insect outbreak, tent caterpillar being a really big one up in the Fort McMurray area. So we don't know if, if this drop in abundance was out of the ordinary for Tennessee Warbler or we're just in that period of the cycle. We'll have to get a, a handle on that as time goes. But what's really interesting is, is to me is you know, changes like Muskeg River and Bison and Beaver Pond, that's really quite a, a significant change from year to year. And I guess I, I could say that although Tennessee Warblers went down, at Beaver Pond, we got hammered with purple finches. And so they drove the numbers up, up there as well. Here's the recaptures from year to year. 54 of the 1,605 birds banded in 2011 reappeared in 2012, of which 48 were migrants, representing 17 species. 46 of them were captured in 2012 at the station in which they were banded. So they're, they're coming back to the same territory year over year. This is the fundamental premise behind the survivorship calculation. You have to have that return in order to calculate survivorship. And we take advantage of the birds wanting to come back to the same habitat year over year. Of the 46, we recaptured one least flycatcher, emphasized because it's on the sensitive species list. It may not have been that least flycatcher, but that is at least a least flycatcher. One red-eyed vireo banded as a second-year female at Beaver Creek Diversion System, so that's the one on the south side of Syncrude in that semi-natural area, was recaptured in the reclaimed bison area in 2012, a distance of about 2.6 kilometers. So here's an instance of a bird moving from what's more natural to something reclaimed and setting up a territory. It's really cool. And a white-throated sparrow banded as a hatch year at Muskeg River recaptured across the Hammerstone Quarry in V-shaped wetland, 3.5, 3.6 kilometers away in 2012. Recapturing hatchier birds is really tricky. They tend to come out of the nest, feed for a while, 
disperse, migrate, and then the, when they come back in the spring, they disperse even more. So they have no fidelity or minimal fidelity to the, their natal grounds. So recapturing hatch years is really um, tricky and good to do. It's good when it does happen. And then of the 54 birds, uh, six were, were all black-capped chickadees, which are resident in Fort McMurray area. Our third objective, then, is to provide a research platform for others who have interest in either birds or something related that the, the network of stations that we have can support. Chris's graduate work is on blood metal concentrations in Tennessee warblers and chipping sparrows, looking at how proximity to the oil sands uh, projects is, is changing or reflected in the blood chemistry of the birds. This is taking a blood sample from a Tennessee warbler. Um, a pretty impressive feat of dexterity. We're talking about looking at stable isotopes in feathers, and this has multiple uses. There is a continental gradient of deuterium in the environment that as you come further and further north, you have less and less deuterium in rainfall. And that can be picked up in in the feathers um, of the birds, and that goes to where those feathers were grown. Birds molt their feathers on a known cycle, and so by, by plucking a feather and analyzing it for deuterium content, you can get a sense of where latitudinally that bird produced that feather. So for young birds, it's their natal ground. For older birds, it's their breeding ground. Again, it's dependent on molt timing, but that's the general rule. So we're looking at uh, a collaboration with uh, Dr. Aaron Bain at the university here to collect some feathers for support of his migration monitoring uh, research. We've noticed some things that the birds are doing um, in the area. Uh, one net over two years, the same net at about the same time of day, but two days offset, got hammered by a flock of young warblers, mixed flock. So there's these mixed flocks of warblers that are hanging around and feeding and bulking up before uh, migration. They tend to, we always tend to catch a chickadee or two with them, so I think the, the warblers are keying in on the, the residents who might know where the food supply is and are picking that up. These warblers are both, uh, we'd like to pose a question that says, are these flocks that are gathering just post-fledging, pre-migration, are they holding together for migration? Or are they, is this just a very temporary behavior where it's safety in numbers and then they disperse and, and build flocks in another way? Another um, curiosity that we've, we've come across is that a lot of the books that we use to identify our birds don't have good information on the juvenile plumage, which is the plumage formed um, it, in the nest. They change out of that plumage very quickly, which they then carry into migration. But because there hasn't been a lot of work, hands-on work, with these juvenile birds in their natal grounds, we struggled in the first year to identify some of our birds because we just didn't have good resource materials. Here's a, a feedback that we can give to the birding community with some pictures and technical notes that can advance the banding world. So we have a list of a lot of questions that uh, we're coming up with for, for future years. Where are we now? We're planning for 2013. Uh, we will be operating the 24 stations that were in operation last year. We've, we will be adding at minimum two more of the stations and possibly a few more than that. We have a long-range plan. I, I, I don't show it here, but we do have one that says, here's how many stations we'd like in natural upland slash riparian habitats. We have not yet stepped into peatlands, but they're an incredibly um, important part of the boreal forest ecology. About half the boreal forest is in some way wetland or peatland. And so we need to get some data into, into those areas or from those areas. And we're definitely looking at keeping the one-to-one -one ratio of natural to affected. Uh, another piece of the boreal forest is the fire cycle. The, the forest is a fire forest. It burns on average about 80, every 80 years. So the whole ecology is adapted to fire. It's a natural process. And so getting some bird banding stations in fire recovery areas would also be um, beneficial. All of the statistics that we, we will be doing require a minimum of three years of data before you can really pin your, uh, any kind of conclusion on productivity. Five years is actually uh, considered the minimum for survivorship. So it's a long-term it, long vision to have this program going for a number of years. 
it is an industrial area, and so um, very practical outcomes of this work. Um, one very practical outcome is to help the companies who are, in fact, supporting this research uh, meet some of their approval conditions set by, by one or bo both levels of government. And as, oh dear, hmm. my hawk grew. Um, Reestablishment of wildlife habitat diversity. This is, appears in almost all of the approvals. The wording varies, so I've just paraphrased it down, distilled it down to its core. Uh, the companies are required to do this, and they must monitor wildlife use of reclaimed habitat and the return of biodiversity. From at least the bird perspective, we can contribute to, to meeting that. The companies have a requirement to participate in regional research and monitoring, um, programs and establish reclamation benchmarks. It's actually part of their approval to help establish the benchmarks by which their re reclamation will be assessed. And in the provincial legislation, returning the lands to equivalent capability is a, a legal requirement. Uh, those of you who are at the resiliency seminar on, on workshop on Tuesday heard the statement, and I think it's true, that that is very loosely defined, but very intentionally so. It allows... Um, society and government to make the determination of equivalency and, and allow that to evolve over time. So equivalency, many years ago, might have been grow commercial forest, hence the gateway approach. Now equivalency talks to biodiversity, habitat diversity, and the like. So they didn't have to change the law. It's just evolved to include that. We also have this new thing called the Joint Oil Sands Monitoring Program, the Alberta Federal Government's Monitoring Program. This is a table that was presented in their plan of February of last year. Uh, cause and effect monitoring for migratory songbirds is explicitly stated in the plan. And so it just essentially goes through, here's your element, here's, here's what we want, and here's how we're going to roll it out. If you look at the MAPS program, we're contributing in those ways. The one that we're missing is design, design of cause effects monitoring for program for wetland birds, but because we have a platform and because we're near wet areas, perhaps somebody else can come in, build off what we're doing, and contribute to the meeting of that objective. This is new. This was based on the discussions from Tuesday at the resiliency workshop. And so... Uh, Dr. Ellen McDonald was talking about criteria and indicators. Uh, can we consider criteria and indicators based on maps? Can you use maps to help you understand or assess resiliency? So the criteria or criterion uh, here would be maintaining healthy populations. Your indicator is, is what do you want to measure to see whether you're meeting that criterion? The abundance of birds is measurable. What form would your indicator take? Here we would look at the capture rate of adults. Adults are usually considered to be the, the population, um, at least in the metrics we're, we're using. You can do that either a total or you can do that by species. And then what metric do you assess by? Well, you can use a percent of natural. If it meets 80% of natural, then you have a healthy population. Or 100% of natural. That's a decision that has to be made among regulators, stakeholders, companies, and the like. Or you could say, as long as you're within the range of natural variability, remember we have very high natural variability, deriving and applying a single number in that kind of um, environment might be very difficult. So instead of saying it has to be a number, you could say as long as a number fits within a range, you're good to go. And I won't read through all of these, but these are just some ideas of how maps can contribute to setting essentially reclamation criteria, which we just saw the companies are required to do as part of their approval. Uh, another picture grew. Oh, well, preliminary conclusions. And these have to be preliminary. They're based on analysis of the 2011 data and our interpretations of what we've seen of the 2012 data so far. Our final report's due at the end of February, so we're busily crunching numbers and writing uh, right now. And by final, I mean the 2012 report. So we can say, I think, fairly confidently that MAPS supports the evaluation of reclaimed habitat performance from a wildlife bird perspective. 
and can contribute to reclamation criteria and indicator development. We can say that mid-story and understory vegetation should be explicitly included in reclamation plans. That's advice based on a couple years. Um, I think it would be better to characterize that as a hypothesis right now that we'll test out over the next couple years, but it, it seems to make a lot of sense. Boreal forest maps data are critical in the evaluation of drivers of population trends. Productivity metrics, survivorship metrics, go to answering why we're seeing a decline in continental bird populations overall. There's a few that are increasing. And that the MAPS program does provide a good platform for complementary research. Our keystone funders who, who took a, a risk on us in 2011 and got us started were Syncrude and Hammerstone. Uh, the two individuals, Fred Payne and Scott Rose, uh, made it happen in... Well, now we count eight other organizations that are sponsoring us. And if you think of the big names in the oil sands area, you're probably hitting them all. One of the weird quirks in all of this is that the contract that their legal department lays on us says, I can't mention their name without explicit written permission. So I can't mention their name. But this is a consortium of oil sands companies that has bought into the program, coordinated through the oil sands developers group. And those companies that aren't sponsoring this know about it and are at least morally supportive. Their money is going to maybe some other research projects that these guys aren't funding. In the end, it will all be shared. Our scientific partner, Institute for Bird Populations, uh, Ron, Aaron, Danielle, Rodney, Dave, plus Peter, who was an author of the paper, uh, provide um, extraordinary support and even come up and, and help us cut net lanes in the springtime and, and train our banders. So with that, I'll say thanks. And 